Now, for the first session in the ICM New Conversation series, this spring we're fortunate to have Eric Chaffetz to converse with us about his newly published book, The Disinformation Age, The Collapse of Liberal Democracy in the United States. The book is available in hardcover from Rutledge um, at a prohibitive price. <laughs> no worry, it's also available as a Kindle edition and there are hopes for a paperback edition. I don't know if you've heard anything more about it. I'm working on it. Good. Um, <clears throat> now, before I say a few words about Eric and his work, I want to let you know about the other ICM Spring events. Mm -hmm. But I might edit on the fly at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Catherine? Yeah. Catherine Klepper is the new program coordinator for the ICM. There's printed material here about yeah, there are event cards for spring on the uh, bureau across from Sarah's desk there. I'm, I'm going to edit. Um, the the um, events that are planned, the talks that are planned for the spring are really remarkable. Um, you will see. Now, the other thing that uh, I do want to mention about the ICM, though, has to do with the graduate reading group program. Uh, the ICM makes grants available every year for graduate student reading groups, and those have been, um, in, in my view, and I think not just my view, remarkable uh, enablers of uh, cross-departmental connections, <coughs> cross-college connections. <coughs> and so you can visit the ICM website and find out more <coughs> about the graduate reading group program. Um, just a few words to introduce Eric Chaffetz. Um, the website biography of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies program tells us that Eric is the Ernest I. White Professor of American Studies at Humane Letters, that he teaches American literatures, American Indian and Indigenous literatures, and U.S. Federal Indian Law, and that his current work <coughs> focuses on Indigenous theory and practice as a critique of global capitalism. Now, Professor Farrah Jasmine Griffin's estimation of Eric's new book is this, quote, the disinformation age contains the brilliance, insight, and originality that we've come to expect from Eric Schaeffels. This historical analysis also sheds light on the difficulties of the present moment as well. Farrah Griffin has a remarkable talent for understatement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, <clears throat> Chaffetz isn't satisfied with describing and theorizing the path of crisis of U.S. capitalism and the failures of the language of American exceptionalism. He also proposes alternatives found in the theory and practice of indigenous peoples. This is an urgent and necessary text. To that, I want to <coughs> read one other assessment of Eric's new book. This comes from uh, Marcus Redeker, uh, whom some of you will know as the author of The Slave Ship, a book that needs reading by you. <laughs> um, Marcus Redeker says, Eric Schaeffitz is one of the smartest, wisest, and toughest cultural critics writing today, a teller of difficult but essential truths. The disinformation age should become a fundamental text for a new era of resistance. And with that, then I'd like us to, to welcome Eric for session today. Thanks, Barry, uh, for the introduction. I appreciate it, particularly having you do it. Uh, since we've been associated productively for so long. Uh, um, I want to thank everyone for showing up for this. I appreciate it. Um, first, want to uh, acknowledge that we are on the location. Our location is the homelands of the Cayuga people. Um, and uh, the Cayuga Nation, and um, I wish Cornell would announce that at major events, uh, commencement, um, convocation. It should. That's where we are. And we ought to acknowledge that. Um, I have more to say about Indian lands later. 
Um, I want to thank uh, clearly the so Society for the Humanities, American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program, English Department, uh, and the American Studies Program for co-sponsoring this. Um, and uh, special thanks uh, goes to the Institute, obviously, for Comparative Modernities for inviting me to give this uh, talk, which is going to be a reading, actually, and particularly to Catherine Klepper for doing all the heavy lifting uh, that made this uh, possible. A great pleasure working with Catherine, and I really do appreciate all the effort that went into this. Um, I want to also thank the, the Metis artist, uh, Dylan Miner, uh, for the poster art. Uh, which has both truth in English and in Ojibwe, Ojibwe win. Uh, I would put my money on the Ojibwe uh, if uh, I were recommending uh, where to put, look for the truth. I would no longer look for it um, at the sub. Uh, I'll be talking about that um, as well. Uh, now, um, I want to start out, I'm going to read from the book. That seemed to be the best decision to make. I have a really lovely PowerPoint, but I thought I wrote the book, and I didn't want to write a paper about the book I wrote. That, that seemed to be fairly redundant uh, when I had the book here, and I could read from it. And I thought, well, the PowerPoint is nice, but it might be good for you to hear what I have to say in my own words. So I picked out some sections to, um, to do that. Let me start the stopwatch very uh, sensitive to time. Um, so uh, a couple of quotes first. The first one's from Charles Blow, New York Times columnist from 2011. And he says, we are slowly and painfully being forced to realize that we are no longer the America of our imagination. Okay? Recently, the UN rapporteur, Philip Alston, came out with a very blistering but honest, obviously honest report on what's going on in this country in terms of poverty. Um, and the quote he used for the, for the uh, right under his, the title of the report was, the American dream is becoming the American illusion. Uh, I call it in the book a hallucination. So I go a step perhaps further than that. Um, the second quote I want to read comes to me by way of uh, my former colleague, unfortunately, my good friend Dag Wubschett, who's now at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's from James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. Just need to get to it. It's from a chapter in the book called The End of Innocence, in which I read both uh, Jeremiah Wright's famous sermons that got him in trouble, particularly the Goddamn America quote, uh, which was taken radically out of context. I don't believe anybody has read these sermons closely. Certainly Barack Obama didn't, or if he did, he failed to account for them. Um, and um, the other thing I read along with Jeremiah Wright is um, Melville's famous uh, novella, Benito Serena. But I'm just going to read the quote from Baldwin, which seems to me to be exemplary of American exceptionalism. I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it. And I know, which is much worse, and this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. One can be, indeed, one must strive to become tough and philosophical concerning destruction and death, for this is what most of mankind has been best at since we have heard of man. But remember, most of mankind is not all of mankind. But it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. That's the message of Benito Serino, and I think that statement by Baldwin gets at the heart of American exceptionalism and runs contrary to what you see up here. So just a little overview, and then I'm going to read some sections. Uh, the disinformation age, the collapse of liberal democracy in the United States moves back and forth, if you were to read the whole book, between colonial American uh, to the present with a particular focus in the present on the Obama administration and particularly Obama's speeches, which I read as classic examples of what I define as disinformation. Simply put, the rupture of political rhetoric from political reality with fatal results. 
If I were to sum up the book in one sentence, I would say it is an historical explanation about how and why the United States is still trying to live a narrative, American exceptionalism, that fails to rationalize the state any longer. And in the book, I define the nation as a narrative that rationalizes state power. And in view of this failure, the book provides an alternate and necessary way, an indigenous way of rethinking or better, unthinking the nation state. Trump is not the problem. Let me start with that. It's delusional to think that he is. He is the latest symptom of the problem, particularly egregious one, but a symptom. The imbricated pair of income inequality and climate change are the two major problems. The Republican Party is not the problem. The Democratic Party is not the problem. Their collusion in a militarized corporate hegemony is the problem. And neither of the two parties can address the problem because they are constituted by it. And I am including Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, the new two left, the two left heroes of the Democratic Party. Our revolution, the Bernie Sanders organization, is not revolutionary precisely because it stays within the so-called two-party system. The military budget and arms trade are the most visible symptoms of the problem. Over 60% of the budget is now going to the military, probably more, and the U.S. controls 70% of the arms trade, and that predicates one thing and one thing only, endless war. That's what it predicates. That's what we've got. Okay, so um, I could end the talk there. <laughs> the nice thing about this book is you could end the book anywhere. <laughs> keep saying the same thing in detail uh, and with other examples over and over. But I thought since we have a little more time, I've used five minutes, 34 seconds, and something here. <laughs> Look at my wonderful iPhone. I'm speaking of corporate capitalism, uh, which I'm a full participant, I guess. Um, so I want to just start reading sections of the, of the book, which I think will get to the heart of what disinformation means and then look at uh, some of these um, indigenous um, uh, solutions that I'm, uh, not only I'm proposing, but the people that I'm reading, Native scholars um, and others are proposing. So I have a quote here. I got a lot from the, I read a lot of newspapers during this time. I started writing the book about uh, five or six years ago during the Obama administration. And I, I, it's probably killed my brain, but I read newspapers incessantly, listened to radio incessantly, and so my head is filled with statistics and nonsense. Um, this is a quote from Theodore R. Marmor and Jerry Mashaw in the New York Times. And it said, over the last 50 years, we seem to have lost the words and with them the ideas to frame our situation appropriately. And I think that's right on the money. We no longer have the language to deal with the problems we face. We've erased it, repressed it. The Oxford English Dictionary defines disinformation as, quote, the dissemination of deliberately false information, especially when supplied by a government or its agent to a fringe power or uh, to a foreign power, excuse me, or to the media with the intention of influencing the policies or opinions of those who receive it. That's the end of that quote. The OED traces the term's English usage. Disinformation itself is, a Russian, is Russian in origin, coined in 1949, back to 1955 when it was first used in English. It is worth remembering that 1949 is also the year of publication of George Orwell's 1984, one of the precursors of the work I am undertaking here, as elaborated in the introduction, which I don't have time to read, but it's a close look at 1984 and Doublethink and Newspeak, which run in very similar ways to what I'm calling disinformation. In what follows, while I retain its crude sense of misleading information, that is, information pointing away from reality, I define disinformation as a reflexive phenomenon rather than a conscious plan of propaganda. I do this in order to analyze what I understand as a deep historical eruption in the political topography of the United States, resulting in a collapse of the two-party system. Disinformation, as I redefine it, is the historical process of erasing history itself, culminating in a disruption or blockage of critical thinking. 
For the ability to think critically is dependent on the ability to think historically. I define historical thinking as a demystifying process of which this book is intended as an example. And I guess I'm not being very deconstructive. <laughs> Um, this information signals a systemic malfunction of liberal democracy, which serves within the collapse of the two-party system a set of class interests. It achieves this precisely by erasing the vocabulary of class, which it does from the Constitution forward by erasing the idea of economic rights. Its idea will not emerge within the two-party system until FDR introduces it in his last State of the Union address in 1944, okay, which, uh, which I analyze in Chapter 2 of this book, um, after which it is submerged increasingly into the present moment when it reemerged for how long remains to be seen, and I don't think very long, in fact, I think it's been resubmerged in the presidential campaign of Bernie, of Bernie Sanders. But one suspects that unless Sanders attempts to turn his campaign into a movement separate from the Democratic Party, the idea of economic rights will be submerged in the business as usual of mainstream party politics. What Sanders' our revolution will become remains to be seen, and it doesn't look to me at this point like it's going to be. This information references both the collapse of the two-party system and the failed state of critical thinking in the U.S. today, which effectively cordons the collapse off from public attention. Whereas the macro level, I define disinformation as a failure of historical thinking, on the micro or syntactical level, I define critical thinking as the acquired skill, acquired skill of analyzing the contradictory structure of discourse that itself does not appear to take account of these contradictions. The purpose of critical thinking is not only to tag these contradictions, but also to offer cogent interpretations of their discursive function in national politics. Disinformation raises the question, what are the limits of our thinking in relation to crucial interrelated social, political, and economic issues? In other words, disinformation is a term that inscribes the limits of capitalism's imagination, the limits where, capitalism, where capitalist logic literally no longer makes sense if we are trying to create a world of socioeconomic justice. In this context, I understand critical thinking as a public process. Critical thinking, or what passes for it, takes place in institutions like the schools, mass media, and political parties and is liberated, limited, or subverted by the epistemological parameters of these institutions which can and cannot be imagined within their theories, and what can and cannot be imagined within their theories and practices. I have friends now who have uh, tenure-track jobs in universities that are leaving them because they can't teach what they want to teach in the universities anymore, which is a critique of capitalism. I take it that critical thinking is fundamental to productive action, which is a simple thought. That is, clearly enough, the actions we take are dependent on the plans we are able to formulate, and those plans are in turn limited by what we can think. In this respect, the thesis of this chapter, I'm reading from chapter one, is simple. The United States is in a historical position where within the collapsed two-party system, it cannot think its way out of the persistent problems that plague it precisely because mainstream political discourse has erased the language necessary to think critically about such problems. And these problems are probably obvious to everyone, an increasing income gap, gap between the rich and the rest, poverty, unemployment, no matter what the statistics, statistics tell you, and underemployment, which is rampant, 95% of the jobs created during the Obama years, this was a Harvard-Princeton study, were gig economy jobs. No benefits, poverty level wages. So a 4.1 unemployment rate doesn't mean anything, particularly when 62% of the, only 62% of the workforce is engaged in work. 38% aren't even trying to work anymore. That includes retired folks, but it's a sizable, uh, significant component. Um, intensifying militarization, a defense budget that constitutes more than half, much more than half of all federal discretionary spending. Things have gotten worse since I wrote uh, the book. I think that's, that's the point. If they could get worse, they're getting worse. 
a health care system that even with the Affordable Care Act, which we're saying goodbye to, leaves 33 million people uninsured. Environmental degradation, a political system dominated by corporate interests, and a fading public education system, a failing public education system, to name the, the problems that come most readily to mind. Okay, that's just about the time. Although the Sanders campaign tried to overcome this erasure, what needs to be emphasized is the enormous divide between using this language in a political campaign and making it the language that the constitutional system is primed to address in an economic bill of rights. One thing to talk these issues, but another thing to get them faced. To begin thinking about the state of the union critically, we could begin by pursuing the proposition with which I began. The two-party system has become, in fact, a one-party state, a shadow play of corporate interests in which what appears to be the extreme opposition of Democrats and Republicans, whatever the former party advocates, the latter opposes, amounts ironically to a collaboration that ensures the continuation of the corporate status quo. If there is a difference between the two parties, it is this. While the Democrats have a finger in the hole in the crumbling dike that is holding back the tidal wave of predatory capitalism, complete privatization of all resources, the Republicans are trying to tear the dike down. That's the Trump agenda, bring in the wrecking crew. But the Democrats have this little finger in the hole. Thus, the Republicans provide a convenient alibi for the equally entrenched corporatism, neoliberalism, if you will, of the Democratic Party. The presidential candidacy and win of Donald Trump, a mark, I take it, of the political desperation of the U.S., constitutes such an alibi. Either way, though, the dike will collapse sooner or later unless it is substantially reconstructed within a framework of wealth redistribution based in a program of economic justice where the rhetoric of income inequality that surfaced in President Obama's speeches in late 2000, 2014 is just that. Uh, rhetoric, which beyond failed attempts to raise the minimum wage, finds no reference in policy proposals. Uh, his 2015 State of the Union speech, for example, didn't mention Poverty wasn't an issue, and we'll start, and 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 progressively we could start with Reagan and go forward. The issue of poverty does not has not surfaced, um, and it's the primary issue um, we're facing, along with climate change. This rhetoric then is disinformation, an apparent concern for the crisis of income inequality that has no reference in the reality <coughs> of domestic politics. So that's the first section I wanted to read. Um, take it through the water. <laughs> and I'll read it up, sir. So I just continue, I want to continue um, reading from sections that um, deepen um, the issue. Disinformation and information exist side by side. Both are near at hand. There is certainly no end of books, blogs, articles, and political, organiza and political organizations critical of U.S. foreign and domestic policy. As the sources of this chapter, I'm still in chapter one, witness. Uh, but whereas information is something we must consciously process through research of one kind or another, reading, listening, observing, and comparing what we gather, disinformation processes us like a dream in the classic Freudian sense, where the dream is a structure of contradictions in which the dreamer never recognizes the contradictory structure. Information requires dialogue. Disinformation is a mesmerizing monologue, often masquerading as dialogue. U.S. political campaigns have degenerated into this kind of drama, as has all too much of what passes for public discourse today. Politics, and the, I quote here from Frank Zappa, the quotes attributed to him, quote, politics is the entertainment division of the military-industrial complex, sums up the situation. 
read it again. Politics is the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. And Donald Trump is its avatar. It is no coincidence that the most political commentary we have had in the mainstream media in the last few years has been on comedy programs like The Daily Show. <clears throat> Whereas misinformation is merely a mistake in report, a reportage, that is uh, typically retracted in the next day's news or a distortion of the truth, conscious spin or unconscious, for particular ends, such as the Bush administration's fictions of weapons of mass destruction. Disinformation is a deep historical process of erasing history itself, culminating in a disruption or blockage of critical thinking in which particular fictions, through repeated and widespread use in our major institutions, schools, media, etc., substitute reflexively for facts. But, and here is the crux of the matter, disinformation appears as, uh, excuse me, disinformation is not ideology. It is rather ideology's mirror image. Disinformation appears as ideology's double, and like the double is the reverse of ideology. We'll talk more about this. Uh, I am using reality here in its most material sense. Who eats? Who starves? Who has health care? Who sickens and dies without it? Who is tortured? Who for reasons of privilege, a matter of location, whether material or geographical or ideological, escapes torture? Who works at a living wage? Who cannot find work or works for wages at or below the poverty line? Who receives an education that helps propel him or her? into or secures them in the materially advantaged classes who is denied such an education. The French Marxist Louis Althusser notes that while ideologies, quote, constitute an illusion, we admit that they do make allusion to reality and that they need only be interpreted to discover the reality of the world behind their imaginary representation. End of that quote. And here's the classic definition from Al Jazeera. Ideology represents the imaginary relationship of individuals to their real conditions of existence. In, uh, end of quote. In contrast, disinformation constitutes an illusion that makes no allusion to reality, or it makes an allusion to what it fantasizes as reality. Disinformation approximates what Jean Baudrillard terms simulation or simulacra. And I quote from Baudrillard, the transition from signs that dissimulate something to signs that dissimulate that there is nothing marks the decisive turning point. The first implies a theology of truth and secrecy to which the notion of ideology still belongs. The second inaugurates an age of simulacra and simulation. End of quote from Baudrillard. Like the simulacrum, disinformation bears no relation to any reality whatever. Okay. Yet, and here I may depart from Baudrillard, although not necessarily, it does immense violence to reality in offering hallucinatory solutions to actual problems. The war on terror is a prime example of a fiction of disinformation. The war on terror has no particular object or end. It is everywhere and can be anything. Paradoxically, it has innumerable centers, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, with infinite possibilities of places and persons. I should add Palestine to that, that fiction with the institution of the National Defense Authority, uh, Authorization Act of 2012, which gives the president authorization to indefinitely detain US citizens suspected of terrorism, even the US has become a potential center of its war on terror. And that's increasingly uh, so, it seems to me. This potential is bus buttressed by the Obama administration, and now I'm talking about really about the past in some sense. This potential is buttressed by the Obama administration's legal rationalizations for the extrajudicial killing of U.S. citizens whom it deemed are aiding and abetting terrorist organizations. Anwar al-Awlaki is a prime example of this, without, murder without trial, or execution without trial. 
Presented to the public as ubiquitous, the war on terror is implicitly presented as beyond debate, a given like the air we breathe. It functions to mobilize public attention to ratify the continued militarization of the United States and to distract public attention from crucial, crucial social issues, which we can't solve because we don't have the language to solve. In contradistinction to the fictions of misinformation, like weapons of mass destruction, which can be countered by a presentation of evidence, there is no evidence to counter fictions of disinformation, like the war on terror. The only, they can only be countered by a revolution in historical thinking, which, for example, might begin, in this case, by erasing the mesmerizing term terror and replacing it with the term resistance, prompting people to think critically about the geopolitical differences and different historical agencies of the movements the U.S. now labels terrorist. Hamas is not ISIS, for anybody who pays attention to what's going on. At the same time, to the extent that misinformation is grounded in disinformation, as the misinformation of weapons of mass destruction was grounded in the disinformation of the war on terror, it can remain exceptionally resistant to information. So there's a coupling here of these two things. Okay, so um, take another drink of water. And then in, I'll read the last section in this particular explication of this information. We okay so far? Yes, sir. Not if you're awake. <laughs> Wait. Um, Okay, so um, the last section I want to read uh, to just, again, just deepen this explanation a little farther. Um, like the double, I think, uh, disinformation destroys ideology. If you know William Wilson, the classic post story, the double always comes back to haunt the seemingly Frankenstein as an example, the normal person, and point out the dark side that hasn't been attended to. That's what disinformation does to ideology. It, it disorients it, it disconnects it, it points out its incoherences, its violences. Um, so that's how um, disinformation uh, functions in relationship to, um, to ideology. So here's what I want to do. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. The primary difference between ideology and disinformation obtains in the imbricated matters of coherence and reference. With all of its internal contradictions, ideology, as noted, presupposes a system of ideas that references reality, however elusively. Uh, now I want to thank uh, my colleague Paul Nadashti for giving me this quote from the Komarovs, uh, which I have, which has proven very, very useful. Um, colleagues have been very, very helpful in this, uh, this text. The anthropologists Jean and John Komarov define ideology as follows. I read their definition. Following Raymond Williams, who seems here to have the German ideology in mind, we use it to describe an articulated system of meanings, values, and beliefs of a kind that can be abstracted as the worldview of any social grouping. Born in explicit manifestos and everyday practices, self-conscious texts and spontaneous images, popular styles and political platforms, this worldview may be more or less internally systematic, more or less assertively coherent in its outward forms. But as long as it exists, it provides an organizing scheme, a, ma a master narrative, they have a question mark after that, perhaps a master narrative, for collective symbolic production. Obviously, to invoke Marx and Engels once again, the regnant ideology of any period or place will be that of the dominant group, and while the nature and degree of its preeminence may vary a good deal, it is likely to be protected, even enforced, to the full extent of the power of those who claim it for their own." End of quote. For the Komarovs, ideology is one of the two dominant forms in which power enters a more accurately, or more accurately, is entailed in culture. End of quote. 
The other is hegemony, a term most frequently associated with the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, who in his prison writings defines, as, it defines it as the spontaneous consent given to the great masses of the population in the general distinction imposed on social life by the dominant fundamental group. And the quote from Gramsci. Following Gramsci's use of spontaneous and the Komarov's interpretation, I would say that hegemony is ideology naturalized. That is, hegemony is ideology that is not recognized as such, but assumes the position of reality. On the other hand, disinformation, as I am using it here, is the antithesis of ideology or hegemony. It is neither systematic, a worldview, nor a master narrative. Rather, it might be read as the disor excuse me, as the disordered wreckage of both. Perhaps, paradoxically enough, we might call it a system of incoherence, a system that, leave, that leaves gaps in thinking, contradictions, across which ideological bridges cannot be built. Yet, if we persist in believing that we are walking across these gaps, we are only falling deeper into the abyss. The pattern of presenting inconsistent positions with no apparent recognition of their incoherence, psychologist Drew Weston comments, is another hallmark of this president, Obama's storytelling. As noted, this is precisely how Freud describes the unconscious in the dream work, and Orwell describes double think. The journalist Thomas Frank puts his finger on the force of disinformation without naming it as such when he notes, quote, people getting their fundamental interests wrong is what American political life is all about. This species of derangement is the bedrock of civic order. It is the foundation on which we all else exist, all else rests, end of quote. Derangement, that's his word, with his sense of psychosis and detachment from reality is the key word here. In contrast to ideology, disinformation is precisely a form of derangement. Ideology become pathology. And I get that phrase from my colleague Joni Mikowski. Thank her for that. Um, there is also certainly a pointed paradox in Frank's formulation where the disorder of derangement, quote, is the bedrock of civic order. We might ask ourselves how long such a contradiction can hold. In what is the Obama style of disinformation, the former president in his December 1, 2009, speech announcing his escalation of the war in Afghanistan promised both an infusion of 30,000 troops with the object of bringing the war to a successful conclusion, doesn't read his Russian history clearly, uh, and a withdrawal of all U.S. forces beginning in 18 months. 30,000 in, 18 months later, we'll take them back. Okay. Um, Bob Schieffer of CBS News commenting on the speech immediately after it concluded remarked on the contradiction of simultaneously commitment and withdrawal. Quote, how do you on the one hand uh, say we need to send these troops over there, it's critical, this is, our, um, this is our national security interest to do this, but then say, but we're only going to keep them there for 18 months, end of quote. This key policy speech points to uh, the systematic structure of disinformation, which is based in profound contradictions that go largely unrecognized, or even when they are recognized, do not receive sustained attention and analysis in the public sphere. Schieffer's critique is an isolated moment of consciousness. Here the contradiction is between a philosophy of guns and a philosophy of butter. We've heard that before, going back to Vietnam. A philosophy of endless war and one of perpetual peace. These philosophies are fundamentally incompatible, obviously, but disinformation yokes them together, giving the appearance of compatibility <coughs> or coherence. Obama accomplishes this yoking as well in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Quote, uh, the title of which was A Just and Lasting Speech, uh, Peace. 
In an exceptionally positive review of the speech in her syndicated column on December 14, 2009, Kathleen Parker noted that the speech was, quote, a meditation on American exceptionalism, end of quote. Indeed, it was an exceptionalist masterpiece of disinformation in its erasure of the extra-legal violence of both recent and past U.S. history and its implicit endorsement of the new manifest destiny, the war on terror. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait is mentioned, that's mentioned, but the U.S. trumped-up invasion of Iraq is not, never came into the speech. Mm -hmm. Thus, when Obama proclaims, quote, those regimes that break the rules must be held accountable, or, quote, I believe that the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war, that is what makes us different from those whom we fight, end of quote. The words ring hollow, more than hollow, they're obscene. Because in the post-Vietnam War era, that difference, to the extent that it existed in the World War II period, worked as ideology then, has collapsed. The president backs these empty proclamations up with, the, with facts that have turned not, out not to be facts. Quote, that is why I ordered the prison at Guantanamo Bay closed. You know it's still open, and Trump wants to uh, use it more and more. The history of U.S. global violence in the Americas, Asia, and the Middle East goes unspecified and is categorized as mistakes, mistakes, okay? which are inevitably justified because, quote, the plain fact is this, the United States of America has helped underwrite global security for more than six decades with the blood of our citizens and the strength of our arms, not to mention the blood of all the citizens who we killed in other countries. No mention of that. In an Orwellian mode intent on rationalizing U.S. policy in Afghanistan, war becomes the way to peace in the speech. Quote, the instruments of war do have a role to play in preserving the peace. That peace is desirable, is rarely enough to achieve it. Peace requires responsibility. Peace entails sacrifice. End of quote. And of course, what is implied, but not stated here, because it would expose the contradiction, peace demands war. That's out of 1984. Okay. Let's see. I think what I'm going to do now is um, skip to the end and do some of the, the, um, the native uh, stuff. One of the things I talk about that I'm not going to read is one of the things ideology requires to work is that a, a subject, capital S, interpolates or hails a smaller subject in other words, and gives that subject coherence and identity through a, a coherent narrative. And so one of the arguments I have in the book is that what disinformation does is destroys the subject. There is no stability or coherence in disinformation. Um, there is no place, if you will, to hang your, your hat. Uh, and that, I think, is a major difference between the Althusserian notion of ideology and my notion of disinformation. Um, the subject is ruined in disinformation. There is no stability. So Althusser uses the church. Uh, you could use the nation, which I think has failed now, uh, or the corporation. All of them try to create an ideology with a large subject that hails or brings into coherence a smaller subject. So I'm not going to read the section I have on that. But I'm going to go to the uh, end of the book and talk a little bit about indigenous solutions to global problems. Um, so we have a few minutes. I want to read some uh, epigraphs, and then I'll just read from the book. The, the final chapter is called Thinking from a Different Place, which is a course I teach here as well. Uh, what is a just society? Uh, a brief manifesto. So I thought if you write a book with this kind of critique, um, which is not exactly that, um, that you should at least at the end of the book propose some solutions uh, to the problems that you're articulating. But I do think the solutions lie in indigenous thinking. I do not think they lie. I do not think the system can be reformed. Let me put it that way. Capitalism cannot be reformed. Um, and it, there needs to be a revolution of some sort. And there are examples of these revolutions, in part successful, in part not, around the world. The Zapatistas, I talk about them. Um, Bolivia, in part. Extractive industry and global capitalism make it hard for a nation state to complete a revolution. 
uh, but they've done some good work there in reducing poverty. So um, I think the revolutionary possibilities have to be considered. Uh, that's my perspective. Um, so for me, and I want to make that clear if it's not already, this system is dead. It's more about it cannot solve social problems. And climate change means we can't kick the can down the road anymore. All right. Because climate change is, is coming, it's not that we can't stop it, and it is going to increase the issues that we are having um, mammothly. It impacts the poor, first of all. Everybody knows that. The rich can afford to escape, escape, escape until they can't escape. Uh, so we're not in a good situation. Um, which is why the book is selling millions of copies. Uh, <laughs> sort of like my version of Anne Rand's The Fountainhead. Uh, so, um, anyway. Some quotes from sane people. It's time for quotes from sane people. We put them in the insane people. First one's from Stuart Hall, a name people should, uh, should recognize. Quote, this is precisely where one kind of globalization from above is being contested. It is true in as yet unequal struggle by another from below. Okay. Next one's from Taiaki Alfred, who graduated from Cornell here in, in government, a political theorist. Um, at the core, at their core, European states and their colonial offspring still embody the same destructive and disrespectful impulses that they did 500 years ago. For this reason, questions of justice, social, political, and environmental, are here considered outside the framework of classical European thought and legal traditions. So you see, there are some people that agree. I'm not alone. Again, a quote, this one from Robert J.C. Young. Post-colonialism begins from its own knowledges, many of them more recently elaborated during the long course of the anti-colonial movements, and starts from the premise that those in the West, both within and outside the academy, should take such other knowledges, other perspectives, as seriously as those of the West which is why indigenous studies here at Cornell should have a large population of students. It doesn't, but it should. And the university should make that clear. It doesn't, but it should. Okay. It is a general name. Okay, so I, I stopped in the middle of that quote. Postcolonium is a general name for these insurgent knowledges that comes from the subaltern, the dispossessed, and seek to change the terms and values under which we all live. And now, two quotes from Leslie Silko, her great novel, Almanac of the Dead. The first is, Tacho recalled the arguments people in villages had had over the eventual disappearance of the white man. Old prophets were adamant the disappearance would not be caused by military action, necessarily, or by military action alone. The white man would someday disappear all by himself, the disappearance had already begun at the spiritual level. And indeed it has. Quite far progressed. And finally, the powers who could, from Silco, same book, the powers who controlled the United States didn't want the people to know their history. If the people knew their history, they would realize they must rise up. So, one of the reasons I wrote the book. Not because I think it's going to cause a revolution, but because people should know their history. All right, so I'll read a little more. We have a few minutes um, before we take some questions. But let me just get a little into this. Um, in this, the final chapter of the disinformation age, I ask the reader to enter a realm beyond the limits of capitalism's imagination and resistant to that imagination. The realm is represented clearly by the pamphlet, which you can get online, by the way, which I teach, Buen Vivir, a brief introduction to the Latin America's new concepts for the good life and the rights of nature. And this pamphlet is written by Thomas Fatoyer, who is a member of the Heinrich Boll Stiftung, uh, obviously in Germany. Buen Vivir, good life, in Spanish, obviously, is the Spanish translation of the Quechua expression, sumac case. 
Paraphrasing, paraphrasing Alberto Acosta, the president of the 2007-8 uh, Constitutional Assembly of Ecuador, Fatire notes, for him and other Buen Viver theorists, it is important to distinguish this concept from the Western idea of prosperity. Buen Viver is not geared toward having more and does not see accumulation and growth, but rather a state of equilibrium as its goal. Its reference to the indigenous worldview is also central. Its starting point is not progress or growth as a linear model of thinking, but the attainment and reproduction of the equilibrium state of Sumac Kase. Buen Vivir is a culture of life based on the ancestral knowledge of indigenous peoples and aims to uh, strike a balance, striving for harmony between humans and nature alike, and which foresees a return to a way of life that had been suppressed by colonization. We must return to being because colonization has made us into wanting to be. Many of us want to be, but as of yet, we are not. We now want to return to our own path, our being. So I'll just finish with one more paragraph, and then I want to read just the very end paragraph, and then we can talk. The agenda here is living in the present as opposed to the capitalist program of deferring life into the future, the American dream. In chapter one, we spent time analyzing James Madison's Federalist 10, noting both its precept that the first object of government is the protection of different and unequal faculties of acquiring property, and its anxiety over the democratic forces at the time that were calling for an equal distribution of property. What Federalist 10 achieves with one stroke of the pen is the naturalization of the unequal distribution of property. This theoretical stroke achieves practical force in the U.S. Constitution by severing the tie between political and economic rights. As we rehearsed in Chapter 2, Franklin Roosevelt made this severance the subject of his last State of the Union address when he called for a very specific economic bill of rights in recognition of the fact that without economic justice, social and political justice was impossible. And he said we would drift into fascism. And I think that's where we're heading. That's what corporate hegemony uh, is the beginnings of. And the end up. So finally, the last paragraph in the book. Maybe we can shoot the breeze, hopefully. Finally, then, let me offer what is perhaps a provocation. The dominant Western story of America, the master narrative of equal opportunity and justice based on in free enterprise, has reached its limit and exhausted itself an exhaustion marked by the increasing distance of its narrative from reality. Ideology has become pathology, that is, disinformation. This story has always confused capitalism with democracy, when in fact the two systems are fundamentally at odds. In this story, we the people say we care for each other. The model is one of Christian charity, a, text, a colonial text I read earlier on. But the gesture is one of pseudo-kinship, and I spend a lot of time in the last chapter talking about native modes of kinship. For history tells us we do not care for each other. A relatively few of us eat while many of us starve. We the people live today in a one-party state, an oligarchy. We do not stand side by side, where what we call democracy or individualism has become an alibi for various forms of exploitation, which do not fit under the heading of democracy, but under the heading of empire. So here at this juncture of history, we are in desperate need of another story, one that answers the question, what is a just society? One of extended kinship, of the kind that has been told in Native American societies for thousands of years. So, I'm done. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take questions. If I haven't stifled all of that.
Yes? So who do you think will, bring, will be the change agents that will kind of show the way to bring back critical thinking? Uh, critical thinking. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. Um, you know, education is extremely important in this process, uh, but at it, it, the lower grades, it's um, critical thinking is non-existent. I mean, they're still spinning the story that I've just done a, a critique of. Um, so by the time you get to college, and even if you get it in college, depends what you take in college if you get it. Um, so that becomes an issue too. So we're talking about a really a fractured educational system. I think it has to occur out in the streets. Uh, I work with a collective down in Raleigh, a Durham called El Colombo, which has close ties to the Zapatistas and have, uh, uh, have their own educational uh, function. Um, and uh, some of, as I mentioned, some of those professors have quit teaching at a major universities because they couldn't teach what they want. So I look to collective operations, like the Zapatistas, uh, who educate. Uh, I recommend their latest book, Critical Thought in the Face of the Capital of Hebrew. Uh, it's, it's an important book. Uh, and I think that's what's going to take place in organizers, um, in unions, um, in, in the places where it's um, pop popular education has always existed, but not in the schools. Great. Hey, my, and my glasses that. barely work back there. <laughs> but I see you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not even quite sure how to formulate my question, but I am curious about the degree to which disinformation um, is, in some sense, the, I mean, part of this, I guess, is trying to coax out some of the argument or hear, hear back from you on this, but the degree to which it's actually a kind of latent reality now, uh, in the sense that, you know, with climate change, for example, and poverty, I mean, both of those things now have completely been not just bracketed, but are completely irrelevant, right, to Elon Musk's and the Peter Thiel's and Alejandro Chafuin's, the, the sort of Ayn Randian uh, lunatics, right, that are sort of running over Brazil now, Honduras, the U.S., and you can, you can go down the line now and actually start to kind of watch the reaction to the pink tide, you can actually see the, um, there's no dissembling, right, there's no actually faking what this is mm -hmm. about anymore. Um, and so I'm curious to the, 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 I'm curious what that, how that would relate to your argument now. If if one, I mean, some might not agree with this. I mean, some might not agree that it's that that the dissembling's over, right? And it's all out on the table. Um, so I'm curious what how that would how you would push that or respond to that, just mm -hmm. as a kind of you mean that it's out on the table. That it's out on the table, and and these characters know it's out on the table, and yeah. uh, and they don't really care yeah. if if you don't agree that their idea of freedom is choice in some kind of idealized uh, marketplace, right? Um, that you know, it, it's irrelevant to them uh, because, in fact, they're instantiating that vision of the world now. Right? So my book is clearly focused on the U.S. And the U.S., I could um, run some of these slides for you, still, um, the, the two major parties are still promoting the exceptionalist narrative, yeah. the American dream. Obama repeats uh, Reagan, um, it, America's back is, uh, is the mantra here, literally back. So um, I was interested in attacking that particular narrative and suggesting that that narrative no longer connects to reality at all. Um, the folks you're talking about, yeah, they're 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 living reality. That's what I would say, uh, and that reality is cutthroat uh, to anyone but themselves. It's the one percent uh, who are now have 45 percent of the wealth in this uh, country, and most of the wealth, um, the upper 20 percent in the world has 86 percent of the wealth. Um, so um, you know those people, that upper 20 percent or one percent or 10 percent, however you want to cut it. Um, is living uh, the reality of things are great, things are good. Um, and um, the rest of the people, uh, I think less and less people, by the way, are buying into this narrative. That's, that's my point with disinformation, that it's not working as ideology on people anymore. People don't believe in the American dream, but they don't, it's still being sold to them from the top as if it was functioning. So I would say that's the, that's the point of the book, is to say, look, you're, you're, you're playing a narrative here that doesn't work anymore. After World War II, there was some credence to this narrative. I mean, it excluded women, it excluded African Americans, but 33% of the private sector was unionized, 
and actual pr production profits did go into rising wages. There was rising wages for a period of time. Um, so that there was some semblance there, you could call it allusion, uh, Althusser's allusion to reality. Starting with Reagan and the deregulation of unions, uh, the rise in income inequality, right, that narrative lost all, all hold uh, on, on reality. So that's what the book was written about, was the fact we're living in a disinformational age, so anybody who still thinks this country can function uh, around the notion of, a, of the middle class, for example, which is a ghost, right, is living within an hallucination, where, and living within an hallucination, you can't be effective in any way, shape, or form. So I would say people need to take account of what you just said. <laughs> uh, and resist it in any way possible. Uh, these people are probably planning to fly to some other planet when climate change becomes unbearable here. I mean, that's what they're thinking, right? Or they can get to a mountain high enough, I don't know, or they can, they can stock water underground, or they can do this or that with all their billions of dollars, which they've you know, taken from this Ponzi scheme uh, we call capitalism. Um, so that's how they're living, I guess. I could, I could say at a certain point they're probably living in an unreality, too. Uh, but, um, you know, they contest that. I don't know, does that speak to... Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, planet Shark Tank, right? I mean, um, <laughs> you know, so it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, well, I want to follow up with you later. Yeah, yeah so, okay. Thanks. Thank Definitely you. planet Shark Tank. Um, yeah. Paul? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But as, as you uh, know, Jeff Bezos has been uh, for, for years now funding a research into colonies on the moon, right? I mean, this is the next, this is like, what he's, he's always been wanting to do. So, so uh, right? you said, anyway, but, but that wasn't my, my, my question. I'm um, coming back to what you said a moment ago, which is that the, the, uh, you, you, you were, you were uh, comparing uh, post-war, uh, uh, I guess, ideology, right? The, the ideology of, 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 of post-war America, as opposed to what you're calling disinformation now, rests on the fact that there was a certain, still a certain, if you will, dynamism of, of, of capitalism that was actually, yeah, right. it was still in right. some sense expanding until, uh, uh, but I wonder if you push that a little farther because um, um, the, 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 um, the obvious connection between the war on terror and the war on communism, right, uh, uh, would, would, would suggest that there is maybe more continuity, in that case, in the ideological structure. Yeah. In other words, what the ideology of post-war had constructed communism with, with, with very little empirical right. ground, right? And then, you know, the, the term morphs into uh, uh, terror, and, 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 and terror and terrorism, and it looks like maybe almost the same thing, but you're making quite a fundamental distinction between those two concepts, I think, in those two moments. Yeah, so, no, so, I, um, yeah. You make a good point. Uh, I think one of the things the book does is uh, point to stages in the development of the United States mm -hmm. where disinformation did play a part. Mm -hmm. I think the translation of uh, genocide, native genocide, into manifest destiny is a disinformational mm -hmm. uh, kind of situation. So what I'm looking at, what I'm looking at then, is the intensification across yes. all sectors gotcha. of this notion of disinformation. So I wouldn't disagree with you yeah, yeah. that the construction of communism and the war on terror have mm -hmm. uh, very similarities. In fact. You know, we're back to Russia now. Uh, yes, we're, we're, we're back to the Cold, Cold War. Uh, yeah. Since we can't solve real problems, yes. let's fight Russia again. Uh, so, um, I, I, but I agree. So, I, I do look at it as not as, as uneven development. Let me put it that way. Uh, so, it's um, it, it does have its um, its uh, past uses. In the in the back. Yeah, um, I'm I'm still trying to observe the. Some of the nuances about the difference between ideology and disinformation. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of it in the context, uh, particularly of environmental issues, which of course climate change is sort of the catch all, the most dramatic. But I'm remembering back to when I was an undergraduate, it was around the time that the limits to growth was being released. And one of the things that that really uh, was talking about, which I think, you know, some, some, writers like Bill McKibben was the first popular one to really sort of in the end of nature say, hey, you know, there's something also going on that's radically different now about scale issues, you know, the scale of human impacts in a, in a, in a natural right. moment. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the extent to which, you know, 
there's you know there's something in the real world. I think you said this, but I'm not sure. There's something in the real world out there that has to do with at least on the on the on the issue of scale of human activity in relation to nature that's actually changing the nature of our relationship to nature and reality, which almost makes it inevitable in my mind that whatever <laughs> mythologies or ideologies we would have had in the past would have to break down you know, in relation to how we think about things. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good book. When was that uh, book released? Which book? The Limits of... You cited the Limits of Growth was 1972. Okay. A, a, yeah, so um, I think a lot's happened um, since then. I, climate change in 1972 was not what it is today, A, in terms of progression from 1972. talking about it. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I think it's important because I think what we're realizing now that we haven't realized, uh, and because it's been increasing and because we haven't dealt with it, that it now has massive scale. The other thing that has massive scale um, is, the, is the growth of the population, which nobody's really talking about, which is moving. There's this book, The Ten Billion, which has uh, come under critique for its lack of significant research or its faults or its problems. And I agree it has problems. But its overall message is pretty powerful and pretty true. And that is we're not dealing with population growth. And when you combine climate change and population growth together, okay, uh, with the, the, the kind of disruptions, massive disruptions, in immigration, for example. People are having to move out of, it, of their regions in Africa because of drought. They're crowding other people out. That brings on conflict, um, this sort of thing. Uh, my, uh, my, if you follow the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that conflict is really over the Jordan River. And I don't call it a conflict. Israel's got so much power. If you follow settler colonialism in Israel-Palestine, Okay, the Jordan River seems to be at the heart of that water. Okay, already we see Cape Town, if you've been following the headlines on Cape Town, is out of water. Um, droughts in California, cosmic fires. So I think the massive, the climate change has increased in massiveness as it would, um, being unconfronted and undealt with. Uh, and that has joined it with these other kinds of, of issues of immigration, which is now, of course, you know, that and um, uh, Russia are the big things in the, in the news, and of course they're distorted in all kinds of ways, but it is occurring, it's going to occur more with climate change, because people are not going to be able to live where they're living, and they're going to have to go someplace else, and that's going to up the ante in terms of conflict. So I think there has been a massive change um, in scale, um, and um, also a certain exchange, is a certain change in certain sectors, not at all, as we've, I've been talking about, of awareness too of what's going on. So first of all, thank you very much, Eric. It's always a pleasure engaging and listening to you. Um, I'd like to press you a little more about the end. You talked about the need for a revolution on the one hand. Yeah. And on the other hand, you talked about uh, that peace does not come from war. Yes. And, and yes. I, I think about the history of for example. Gandhi and King had something to say from that, too. So. Uh, <laughs> I think about the history of the United States, for example, right. or France, uh, which are the children of the revolution. Um, right. And it is interesting, in the United States, the revolution actually hasn't ended, because it started with a group of perhaps corporatists who wanted to ensure their interests. Yes. Uh, to replace another set of corporatists. Um, and they called it a revolution. <laughs> and then it became violent, and it became a civil war. And the civil war now continues. Uh, as the, the weakest uh, are, are fighting each other uh, to support the 1%, 46%. So I, I'm thinking about the language of revolution, mm -hmm. and I'm saying, if that's what you're saying, then isn't that precisely what they want? They want us sitting in this room, discussing this, mm -hmm. so that it continues. Mm -hmm. uh, or are you talking about another kind of revolution? Mm -hmm. uh, and you quoted Tyagay Alfred, and there are many others before Tyagay Alfred right. that said the same thing. Right. Uh, and have repeatedly continued to say. So can I press you a little more about peace does not arise from war, and what type, of, what is the character of that revolution? 
if it is a real oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm currently focused. You know, the, I'll use the Zapatistas as a model. So this is my, my current story. It's in the last chapter of the book. In 1994, the Zapatistas rebelled in Chiapas, and they very quickly gave up weapons. They were asked by the surrounding population to give them up. And also, I think they saw fighting the Mexican government. It was a no-win uh, situation. So what they seeded to do was to withdraw from the main structures of society and develop these autonomous villages, which have uh, continued to uh, prosper, actually. And I'm told by people who go down there and, and know it, I'm trying to go down myself with this El Colombo Collective, um, that they're doing better. In fact, I think it's generally known than villages supported by the Mexican government. They have better health care, they, they have uh, democracy, they work on women's rights, and they're now running a candidate for president, uh, an indigenous woman f as a candidate for president of Mexico, not to join the structure, but to call the structure into question. The collective I work with in Raleigh, Durham, has withdrawn itself from any government support whatsoever. It, it has its own cleaning collective, it has its own construction collective, it has a legal collective, a medical collective. Um, and it divides the profits amongst all of its working class people, middle class people, if we can use that term anymore, the bourgeoisie, let's use that term. Um, so I think for me the revolution is not armed. I don't think that, that, that's going to that's gonna work. I think the revolution is smaller communities developing autonomous relationships with each other and withdrawing from the government. I think in Bolivia, although this is a nation state and it's far from perfect, in 2000, when they tried to, Bechtel tried to privatize water, people came out on the streets with very little violence, relatively, and just shut the country down. Uh, and they got a new president eventually out of that. Now, there have been problems with that, but Evo Morales and that government has been able to reduce poverty considerably, and at least has an environmental consciousness, uh, which we can't claim to have as part of, uh, a part of our, our public policies. So I look to those kinds of revolutions. I think if the people in this country uh, the 50%, I have a nice uh, slide, 50% of the people, according to the Economic Policy Institute, um, are living at or below the poverty line in this country. 50% of the people. If you look at the savings of people, nobody has any savings to retire. Literally. I mean, the, the, the numbers are, are very, very, um, very, very disproportionate. So I think if, if these people could get together, the government could be shut down. You could create a crisis that would be at least from the instigators, not violent. Now, what the government would respond is another uh, story, uh, but we've seen that story repeated with Gandhi, and we've seen that story repeated with uh, the civil rights movement. The outcome now would be, I think, uh, could be significantly different. But I'm not looking, let me put it this way, I'm not looking for an armed revolution. I don't think that's going to be a solution. Um, I think, if possible, and of course everybody would call it utopian, so I give a, at least a couple of practical examples that the, the attempt to, to form self-sustaining communities that withdraw from the political process as it's so constituted would be the way to go. I don't know if that speaks to your concerns or not. And I don't think war produces peace. I'm a, just a Gandhian. I mean, it produces more war. That's its purpose. Um, and the Gandhian, just, I don't want to be visible, but the Gandhian, agenda has led to Modi, who's one of the biggest supporters. Yeah, well, I, that's that's sort of his responsibility. Yeah, but I'm not necessarily Gandhi's responsibility. So where's, where is the revolution? No, it's well, I, I, I've given you, my, my idea of revolution is the Zapatista form of revolution, which is the formation of autonomous communities um, and a withdrawal from political processes, um, the status quo. That would be my sense. Way in the back there. Hey, Eric, thanks a lot. Um, I, my, my eyes start to fail me at a certain point. It's Russell. Oh, Russell, hi. I saw you. I didn't see you. <laughs> yeah, my new glasses do go back up. <laughs> You're on the same longitude as Ray was, so I can still, I can, I can still, I can still, I can still see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, okay. Yeah, of course. No, thanks for this. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think you're right, you know, it's, um, but I, I, I wanted to, you know, I'm looking for some source of, um, of hope here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the wrong guy. I know, I know, I know that. I know. I, uh, but I, I'm wondering, I mean, so you talked about a number of models that I also admire, uh, including the Zapatistas, but um, what would it look like?
look like even here in the belly of the beast, um, and I mean that in a number of respects, but also quite, quite pointedly here at here at Cornell. Right. Um, what are the possibilities for constructing from below a kind of um, alternative model? Um, you know, even in the heart of the corporate university, um, uh, a collective model, a, a, a commune, um, uh, a, a structure um, that nurtures a revolutionary imagination. Is that is that possible outside of the classroom, inside of the classroom? Is it possible in, in, in any sense within higher education? You mean within the institution? Within the institution. That's a good question, Russell. Um, history would probably say no, I think, at this point. Um, unionization in public universities hasn't worked uh, effectively to stop what's, what's been the, you know, the reduction of the tenured workforce to uh, a completely contingent workforce, basically. 30% uh, of the jobs, low pay, no, you know, minimal benefits, but you can get fired any time, and that makes you vulnerable to any kind of free speech you might have, uh, you might have on campus. So, I mean, looking at institutions, which is why my uh, colleague and, and former student at Penn Law School, Alvaro Reyes, who had a tenure track job in North Carolina, I don't think Alvaro would know when he was saying this, at all, I know he wouldn't. Um, and was going to get tenure. He was a very productive scholar. Uh, quit to work with his collective, El Colombo, because he felt he could no longer teach within that system the kinds of class, critical classes that he wanted to teach. Now, still at Cornell, we could, um, I guess, noblesse oblige, I, I'm not sure what to call it. Um, we can do that. Um, as the university itself has a very, as you know, I'm telling you anything anybody in this room doesn't know, has this incredibly corporate structure with, with ties to some very murderous operations in Qatar uh, and in Palestine and Israel. Um, so uh, we've, we've had, in the past, to try to form organizations to resist that. Um, the corporate machine has moved ahead. Um, so it would take a kind of organizing um, that given the, particularly the transient uh, identity of the student body, which leaves every four years, so it, it's hard, would need to go to the faculty. And uh, my uh, experience in the faculty senate, I have a long experience in the faculty senate, says we've passed resolutions actually to try to stop this, and then have ignored the resolutions themselves, and certainly the administration has ignored them as well. So I'm not particularly hopeful about um, that particular structure. So looking at the corporate university, not just Cornell, uh, uh, obviously, uh, but across the board, um, I don't see this as the place uh, to form um, those kinds of uh, resistant organizations. That doesn't mean, I, I heard a native guy on the radio out in the, uh, west, uh, out in the west where we have, we have a house in Santa Fe. Um, he, they asked him about hope, since you asked me about hope. Uh, and he said, uh, I go out every day, he says, I don't think about hope. He says, and I don't think about despair. He says, I just go out and organize, right? And that's sort of my mantra. I mean, really, I, I, I would be the last person to discourage any kind. Obviously, we're in an organization <laughs> together. I'd be the last person to discourage any organizing. I would encourage organizing of all kinds. Uh, I would just not have any hope about it, um, nor despair about it. Uh, I would just go ahead and do it and see what it can bring, what it can do. I don't think people... I'm certainly not here to tell people to give up. That's the last thing I'm here to do. I'm just here to say to them, look at what you're facing. I think, if anything, that's what my book's about. Look at what you're facing, and then coordinate your resistance according to that. Um, I think that's what Marcus Rediger meant when he said the book was a new text for resistance, is that in order to resist something, you've got to know what it is. And I know we're all working on that. I mean, you, you, we all, as scholars, work on trying to bring reality to, to bear on what, what's going on, uh, rather than the fictions that, um, that exist. So that's sort of my take on that. We good? <coughs> yeah, there's some um, material for a reception. There's food and drink. Another word for that is wine. <laughs> it's right next door, so hope you can see. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks,